Hello, welcome to this lesson in AC circuit analysis. The title of this lesson is called Reactive Power with an Inductive Load. So we're going to talk about the concept of reactive power here, and we're going to be talking about the concept when that applies to having an inductor inside of the load. In the last section we had just a resistive network, just resistors, and we talked in great detail about what's going on with the power when we just have resistors. So if you haven't watched that section, go back and watch it, and you <clears throat> to reacquaint yourself what's happening with the resistive network is we have an, a, a non-zero average. We have an average amount of power delivered to that resistor, and the, it's, it's oscillating, the instantaneous power is oscillating up and down, but it's always positive, and so there's always an average value when you have a resistive network. Here we'll talk about what happens when we have inductive loads. In the next section, we'll talk about what happens when we have capacitive loads. I'm really excited to teach this because up until now, we talk about resistors, everyone can wrap their brain around resistors, right? Because resistors are kind of the easiest thing to understand in circuits. They, they obey Ohm's law, V is equal to IR, and you have some kind of familiarity with, with what's going to happen when these sinusoids go up and down, and things are in phase, you know, the current and the voltage are in phase, so it's kind of, even though there was a lot of math in the last section, it was very uh, easy to follow, I think, if you watch it enough times and study it enough times, what's really happening with a resistor. But when you have inductors, and when you have capacitors, suddenly the current and the voltage across those things are no longer in phase, and things get a little bit murky. So we're going to take it slow, we're not going to do any problems, so we're going to do theory for the next few sections. And when you get to your problems, you'll understand these terms. You'll understand what's really happening. So let's revisit. This is what I call the granddaddy power equation. I'm going to leave it on the board for, very, uh, for a great many uh, sections. It's instantaneous power. So if you start the stopwatch and time marches on, this is the time dependence here. This is a constant term. These are, this is the time dependence. You stick in the numbers. Uh, with your phase angles for the current and the voltage, which is going to be governed by your circuit that you have. And this is going to be some kind of sinusoid over time. And it's telling you that the instantaneous power is always changing. But we want to zero in on the case when we have just an inductive load. What's going to happen when there's just an inductor inside of the box? Last section we talked about what happens when there's a capacitor in the box. Now we're going to talk about if uh, the load is purely inductive. What happens? And I can tell you right now, actually, it's something really cool that happens. And I, I, I find this stuff really fascinating with circuit analysis. So this is some, some of the reasons I'm really excited about teaching it. All right, the first thing you need to remember, there's very, very few things I tell you in circuit theory to just remember. All right, one of them's Ohm's law, V is equal to IR, right? You have to know that. Some of the real basic power equations, just memorize them. What I'm gonna tell you here is something you should just remember. When you have a purely inductive load, all right, the current, okay, through that inductor, lags the voltage by 90 degrees exactly. The current lags the voltage in an inductor or across an inductor by exactly 90 degrees. Current lags the voltage by 90 degrees. I'm going to show you how to prove that to yourself, but just remember it. Because if you can just remember it, that these few little things I tell you to remember, it's going to make your life so much easier. So let's go down here and write that down. And I'll explain what I'm talking about. The current lags the voltage by, I'm going to put the word exactly, 90 degrees. And I'll give you a hint. When we get to capacitors, it's also going to be 90 degrees, but the current is not going to lag the voltage. In a capacitor, the current will lead the voltage by 90 degrees. So the 90 degrees part is going to be easy to remember. The leading versus the lagging is what always confused me when I learned this stuff the first, first time. Finally, you're just going to have to, to commit it to memory. The current lags the voltage in an inductive uh, or across an inductive load when it's purely inductive. Now, why do we care about that? Because in this power equation, we see we have all these phase differences between the current and the voltage. So when we say something like the current lags the voltage by exactly 90 degrees, what we're really saying in words is the following. We're saying that the phase angle of the current is equal to the phase angle of the voltage, whatever it is, minus 90 degrees. Make sure you understand this little equation here. Current lags the voltage. That means whatever the voltage phase is, you subtract 90 degrees, and that is going to be what the current is. So again, make sure you understand. Whatever the voltage phase is, shift it 90 degrees, look to the left 90 degrees, so you subtract 90 degrees, that's what the current phase is going to be. So the current lags the voltage by exactly 90 degrees. So another way to rewrite this, this is kind of the layman's terms way to put it, but if you rearrange things a little bit, what it's basically saying is theta V minus theta I is 90 degrees. 
So again, move the theta i over here, move the 90 degrees over there, boom, you get this. Why do we, why do we write it like this? Theta v minus theta i. Okay, the reason we write it like that, I can even put parentheses around here if you want. The reason we do that is because this equation has theta v minus theta i everywhere. So you see when the load is purely inductive, you basically stick 90 degrees, positive 90 degrees in here, in here, and in here. And you should know that the cosine of 90 is zero and the sine of 90 is one. So that's gonna drastically simplify this equation and make it something that we can study when the load is inductive, right? Remember back to the last section when the load was resistive, theta V minus theta I was zero because the phase difference between current and voltage, there is no phase difference between them. They're, they're in lockstep with one another. When we say these guys are shifted by 90 degrees, we mean the sinusoids are shifted um, in, uh, in 90 degrees along their horizontal axis like that. So we'll actually plug this number in and study it for a second. But I wanna talk for just a minute about this statement one more time, current lags voltage by 90 degrees in an inductor because I guarantee you will forget it at some point in the future. And I wanna tell you, if you forget on a test, if it's leading or lagging, how do you, uh, re how do you, you know, uh, figure it out for yourself? What it comes from is if you remember back when we studied inductors, the voltage across an inductor is L, the inductance, times DI DT. So this is the rate of change, the derivative of the current flowing through that inductor. So you see, these are very interestingly related. The voltage is not related to the current. It doesn't matter the magnitude of the current. The current can be a milliamp or a microamp or a nanoamp, okay? But if it's changing really, really, really fast, then you can have a very, very large voltage across that inductor. So even if you have microamps, but it's rapidly changing super, super fast, right? then this DIDT can be really, really big, even if the current is small. So you see an inductor, the voltage is related not to the current, it's related to how fast the current is changing. And that is why these guys are shifted out of phase by 90 degrees, because if you go and, and draw it here, let's go and actually draw the current, okay? So this guy is going to be time, and this guy is gonna be the current through our inductor. So let's just say for the sake of argument that we're gonna start out, um, with a cosine, let's just say we have a cosine because these are all cosine functions, and we're gonna plot the current. So here is a, co a um, well, let's say it's a sine. Let's go like this. Start like this, like this, and so on. So let's just say, for example, that this is the current flowing through the inductor. At time zero, it starts up like this, and it goes down, and it goes up, and so on, all right? What is the voltage gonna look like across that inductor? Okay, and this will be the voltage. What's it gonna look like? Well, we need to draw some lines to help us draw some things here. At the maximum here, I'm gonna draw a little line here. Where it crosses zero, I'm gonna draw a little line here. At the negative maximum, we'll say it's right there. And then here at zero, we'll say it's right here. And we can draw one more if you want at that maximum right here. So what we're basically saying is that the voltage here that we're plotting is some constant times di dt. Now right here, as it's crossing through zero, this guy has the maximum slope it's gonna have. The derivative is the maximum right here. So the voltage is gonna start at a maximum value. And then what's gonna happen is it's gonna go, the, the, this guy's going up, 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 up. Eventually it gets to the plateau here. At the top, the derivative is zero because the, the, the function is not changing anymore here. So what happens, it's, it's, it's gonna go like this. This guy's gonna start to bend down and it's gonna go through here. And I'll just continue drawing it for you here. It goes down below to a negative maximum here, up through here, and then there's a maximum here, and then it goes down like this. So this is what it's gonna look like. Make sure you understand that. So you see everywhere there is a peak, the derivative should be zero. Here is a peak, the derivative should be zero. Here is a peak, the derivative should be zero. Here, the derivative is a maximum positive number because it's sloping this way. And as we go down this way, the derivative also is a maximum, but it's slanted the other direction in the negative slope direction. So we should have a negative maximum here. Here, the derivative is sloping back positive maximum here. So you see what's happening is everywhere in between, the thing is changing and it's just kind of crossing through these points. So this is nothing new. This is basically a, a, a sine and here's the derivative. We know the derivative of sine is cosine. That's what I've drawn here. All right, but what I want you to notice is that what we said here, current lags voltage by exactly 90 degrees. Make sure you understand that. It's a little easier to understand it if I actually kind of do a dotted line in the negative time direction like this. 
right? Current lags voltage. What that means is that any point in time, right? Let's pick right here. This is the voltage right here. We're saying that it, right at this point, here's what the voltage is looking like. The current is going to lag that guy by 90 degrees. So if I take this guy and go 90 degrees to the left, this is exactly what my current is doing at that point in time. And that's what's basically happening. If you pick any point along this voltage curve, let's say this point right here, this maximum, right? We say the current lags the voltage. So where the, basically the voltage hits the peak first, and then a little bit later, the current hits the peak. The voltage here hits a trough here, and a little bit later, the current hits the trough. So you see the current is lagging the voltage, right? The current is lagging the voltage by exactly 90 degrees because as the voltage gets to wherever it's going, 90 degrees later, okay, then you have the current doing the same thing. So it's a little bit of a delay there. You can look at it a couple different ways. If you take this guy, shift it to the left 90 degrees, that's what's happening at your, uh, on your curve at that point. So, if you forget that the current is lagging the voltage by 90 degrees, you can derive it by drawing pictures. But that takes time, so I just recommend remember it. Inductors, current lags voltage, current lags voltage, current lags voltage, current lags voltage. When we get to capacitors, it'll be, I don't want to confuse you now, but it'll be a little bit different. So, this was an aside. The point of this was to show you that theta V minus theta, not, theta I is exactly 90 degrees. And you should all remember that the cosine of 90 degrees uh, is going to be equal to zero, and the sine of 90 degrees is going to equal one. So let's take this information and we're going to go over to the right hand side of the board and write down what the instantaneous power looks like um, now that we know that it's an inductive load. What we have, this first term is going to actually disappear because it'll be cosine of 90 degrees, which is zero. So this disappears, right? Here's a cosine of 90 degrees, so this disappears too. So the only term that we have is this term, but notice we have sine of 90 degrees. Sine of 90 degrees is 1. So the only thing here in this instantaneous power is the negative, these coefficients here, and then this guy at the end. So what you have is negative Vm Im over 2 times the sine of 2 times omega t. So this is, I'm going to switch colors, this is really important. This is the instantaneous power when they have an inductive load. All right, so I'm going to kind of circle this. Now, I am going to kind of caution you here. I'm giving you a lot of theory here. You're, you're not going to use these instantaneous equations much when we're doing real circuit analysis. We're going to use phasor techniques and other things. But I'm trying to really show you where all this stuff comes from because you will probably have a few questions on it. And more than anything else, the books, a lot of them are really hard to follow and what's happening with this math here. All we're doing is taking this instantaneous equation. We know what the phase difference is for an inductive load. Most of these terms drop away. And here is what it really looks like for an instantaneous power uh, in an inductor when you have purely inductive load. Now, the rest of my lecture is just going to be some comments about this very simplified equation because now we have just inductive load, everything drops away. So I'm not going to write too many things down, but I'm going to make sure you understand everything. All right, the first thing is, the most important thing is, the average over one period, actually I'm going to write this one down. So I'm going to put the average power over one period is zero. Make sure that sinks into you. Okay, remember we talked about how do you calculate the average power over a period? Well, you integrate the instantaneous power over dt over one period, and then you divide by t. We did, talked about that just in the last section. So if you were going to figure out what the average power was here, you would take this guy and you would integrate it. But notice that it's just a sign. Right? It's got two omega t, but you're integrating over one whole period. So you've got a doubling of the frequency. So you have this in a similar way for the resistor. The frequency is doubled, right? But you're still integrating over a complete period. So you're going you're gonna to catch that sinusoid exactly where it starts if you start anywhere and integrate over one entire period. So since it's a sinusoid, it's just got a coefficient here. Some Half the time it's spending on the positive side, and half the time it's spending on the negative side. You integrate that, you get zero you get zero. That means the average power over a period is zero. That's totally different than a resistor. Remember, go back to the last section. We talked about the average power. It was non-zero because when we integrated all this stuff, this first term gave us, a, gave us an average power that we 
you know, then used to, to say, here's what the average power is delivered to a resistor. But in an inductor, the average power is zero, right? If you look forever and ever and ever, the average power is zero, okay, for an inductive load. And so that uh, also, another, another way to say this, is that the, there's no transfer of energy from electrical to non-electrical form in an inductor. So in a resistor, we say that the power is delivered to the resistor and it re-radiates it out as heat that's lost to the environment. In an inductor, the energy that you deliver to the inductor during half the time gets stored in the magnetic field in the inductor, and then the other half the time the energy is kind of pulled out. But it doesn't ever get dissipated to the environment. It's not lost to heat. It goes into the magnetic field and it comes out and kind of is transferred back to the circuit. So it's the sloshing effect back and forth, delivered and then taken from, delivered and then taken from. That'll be a little bit more clear uh, in the other, in, here in a second. The instantaneous power is twice the frequency of the original frequencies that we we're talking about. So we, that's kind of similar to the way it looked for, for the resistor. And I already said this, power is stored in the magnetic field and then later extracted. So I wanna talk about that. Power is stored and I'm using these terms loosely, um, you know, it's really energy is stored in the magnetic field. In the magnetic field and later extracted. All right, now what do I mean by that? Notice that this instantaneous power is, a, is basically a sine function. It's got a doubling of the frequency. That means, some, and has, we have a negative sign there, but that means sometimes this instantaneous power is going to be positive, and sometimes the instantaneous power is actually going to be negative. That did not happen for a resistor, if you remember. That thing was oscillating above the horizontal axis. It was never negative. But for an inductor, everything else drops out. This is what we're left with, ladies and gentlemen. Half the time, instantaneous power is positive. Half the time, it's negative. What does that physically mean? What that physically means is when the instantaneous power is positive, when it's greater than zero, that means energy is stored. Um, in the magnetic field. And what magnetic field are we talking about? Don't forget an inductor is a coil of wire. The reason it's coiled like that is to concentrate the magnetic flux inside of that coil. So the energy is actually stored in this invisible thing we call the magnetic field, and it's, it's a real thing. It's energy stored there that can do work later on down the line. When does it come out is when, during part of the cycle, P that we calculate here is less than zero. So when it's negative, the energy is extracted from uh, the magnetic field or from the inductor, however you want to say it. That's really, really, really important. And this is kind of where I start to get a little bit excited about teaching this kind of stuff. It's, it's really a, a, a beauty and symmetry, what's going on here. You have this device, it's a coil of wire. If you stick a current through it, it concentrates a magnetic field inside the coil. And magnetic fields, we can't touch them or taste them or even see them, but we know that they can store energy. And then you say, well, how can something that's invisible store energy, right? How does that even work? Well, what's happening is that all of these circuits we're talking about are sinusoidal. That means they're driven by sources that oscillate up and down. And that means that for the inductive components, some of the time, the power that you calculate across the terminals of that inductor is gonna be a positive value. And we know from our, our, from our sign convention of power, when you have a positive power, that means energy is being delivered to that load. For resistive, it just gets dissipated into space as heat. But when we're talking about inductor, it doesn't get dissipated, it gets stored inside the magnetic flux inside of the, the coil of wire that we have, right? But then later on down the line, the source swings the other direction and things oscillate back the other way and then current starts to come out of that inductor. And then some of that energy is extracted from the magnetic field because then the magnetic field collapses down to zero again uh, and as it happens, that magnetic field, which is storing energy, is contributing to the current flowing out of that inductor as it collapses down. And that's a very real thing. I mean, if you put a lot of energy in a magnetic field and then you unplug it and you hook it up to something, I mean, you can see the current bleed out of that as the magnetic field collapses. And so that's real energy transfer. So it's kind of like a temporary battery. You can't, you know, it's not practical to like, power a car with inductors or anything like that. But as a temporary storage device, you can store energy in an inductor when we're saying the power is positive part of the cycle here. And then we can extract it whenever 
this is negative. Remember, when we're talking about our circuit analysis we've done all along, we've done power calculations, and you, when you, for the resistors, you always find the powers positive. But for the sources, even back in DC analysis, you usually find, you always find that the power uh, that the source is delivering is always negative. And we always said, hey, conservation of energy, the power delivered by the source is equal to the power that's dissipated or absorbed by the resistive network, right? So they have to add up, they have to be equal and opposite. So we had, we've had this sign convention all along. Positive means the thing is absorbing something. Negative, we've usually talked about negative power being sources that are, that's delivering power to the circuit. It's the same convention here. When the inductor is part, on the part of the cycle where the inductor has negative power, it's just delivering energy, much like a source, much like a temporary source of energy. In fact, it is because it's had energy stored in its magnetic field. So the way to think about it is inductors and capacitors, we'll talk about in here in the next section, there, when you get into these AC analysis cases, basically you have this sloshing around of energy. Sloshing, or you can think of it as like a two buckets. I'm pouring water in this bucket, then pouring water in that bucket, pouring water in this bucket, pouring water in that bucket. On the whole, I'm not really, I don't really have any average power delivered anywhere on the whole, because half the time I'm pouring water in this bucket and half the time I'm pouring water in this bucket. So the water is just kind of staying here in my two hands, it's not going anywhere. That's why the average power is always zero, because half the time the inductor is absorbing energy and the other half the time it's delivering energy back to the circuit that gave it the energy to begin with. So it's like this ping pong, I can use as many analogies as you want, it's like ping pong. I hit the ball this way, I hit the ball that way, I hit the ball this way, the ball's still staying here on this table, so average power is not really being a radiated to the environment or anything, it's staying in the system, but half the time I'm delivering and half the time I'm absorbing. That's about as many analogies as I can get, uh, give you there, but it's, that's what's happening. Energy sloshing back and forth, but the average power is zero over time because it's kind of always staying on the court here, it's never going anywhere else. So the last thing I'm gonna leave you with is a little graph here. We said this is the instantaneous power, this is what it is. Let's draw a picture of that real quick and then we'll close the section off and talk about capacitors. So this is time, so this is the instantaneous power. What would this look like? Well, this is a constant, so forget about it. This is a sign, we know what signs look like, but we have a negative sign out there. So it's gonna look like an upside down sign. It's gonna, instead of starting up like this, it's gonna start like this, like this. Okay, this is the instantaneous power. It starts in the negative direction only because of this negative sign that's here at time zero. Uh, that's what you have. And so it starts here because it's negative and you can see that initially it's negative so the the uh, inductor's delivering energy and then here it's absorbing and here's delivering and here's absorbing and here's delivering and so on and so forth. I want to draw a picture of this for you because later on we talk about capacitors. Um, this will be flipped upside down and it'll look the same except it'll be it'll be upside down. So I'm going to be drawing a lot of parallels between inductors and capacitors as we go forward here. So the big takeaways, and notice that the average power is zero. The, this is the instantaneous power, right? But if you draw a line right through the middle, of course, you're just looking at the middle of the sine wave there. So the average power is zero, half the time we're delivering and how, half the time we're absorbing power in this abductor, inductor. So, quick, quick 10 second recap. Here's the instantaneous power, the granddaddy equation. Then we figure out that for inductors, current lags voltage, which means theta V minus theta I is positive 90 degrees. We put 90 degrees in this term, this term disappears. We put 90 degrees in this term, this term disappears. We put 90 degrees in this term, and we're left with this times this, this is one, this whole thing's one, times this, which is our instantaneous power equation for an inductive load. Because it's just a sign that is half the time positive, half the time negative, the average power is zero. Power stored in the magnetic field and later extracted. When this part of the cycle is positive, we're storing energy in the magnetic field. When the part of the cycle is negative, we're extracting energy and it's kind of sourcing from that inductor to the rest of the circuit, energy from the magnetic field. And here's a plot of what's going on. So try to internalize that as much as you can and relate that back to what we learned in the last section for resistors. For resistors, the power like this was a sine wave all right, but it, it did not have an average of zero. It was all shifted up and it was all positive up here. That's because resistors really do dissipate energy and you're not doing any sloshing. It can't store anything, so you can't slosh back and forth. You just deliver energy to that resistor and it gets radiated to the environment. It's lost from the system. That's why the instantaneous power is always positive for resistors, but for inductors it can be positive and negative depending on what part of the cycle you're at. So let me close here. 
Watch this a few times to get it. Follow me to the next section and we will make a very similar argument to show you how capacitors are very similar, but yet obviously slightly different. It's the, the, the cousin to the inductor. So you'll see how that works in the next section.